we are here in uh, Alva, Oklahoma, and I've come here to interview John Cameron about some of his early day experiences here in Alva. He has an interesting career, and he's going to tell us some of the highlights. And the date is October 23rd, 1972. And Mr. Cameron, if you'll take the mic and give us some of your experiences. father uh, made the run into the Cherokee Strip and took a claim 10 miles northeast of Enid in 1893. Uh, my maternal grandfather uh, came to the Cherokee Strip from <coughs> Medicine Lodge and settled on a farm uh, four miles north of Capron. In uh, 1893, my mother and father were married, and uh, they didn't go back to his claim because he didn't have uh, a satisfactory living quarters. They went to uh, his parents, home close to Hennessy and it was there uh, I was born in 1896 uh, of course that was three years after the strip opened we later moved to the farm that he had taken in the run and uh, we lived there until 1900 at which time we moved to Enid. Uh, Enid was, uh, had ambitions of being a large city, I think, even in those days. But they numbered the uh, streets from the east edge of town toward the square. And uh, we lived in the 400 block on East Main. Incidentally, that's named after the battleship Main. The uh, I first attended school in a rural school up close to uh, the Kansas border and during the time my mother was uh, in the hospital for one month. Then we moved back to Enid where I entered the uh, public schools. At that time, there were about uh, three schools a two-room school out on east in East Enid where they had the first and second grades. The central school was close to the Rock Island tracks. Then there was another school, a ward building, that uh, took care of the first eight grades on the west side of town. Uh, there was also a Negro school, all black, on the uh, east side of Enid. Uh, even though um, none of the school facilities uh, compared to anything modern, the old central was relatively new. 
the Negro school was in a dilapidated condition from any time that I could remember. Uh, we uh, uh, they they organized uh, the first attempt at a junior high school about uh, 1911. And the junior high school was in the high school building that was built about that time uh, at the south edge of Enid. Uh, prior to that time, the high school, or what high school they had, was in the old opera house uh, just off of the square, just east of the square in Enid. Uh, in, in 1912, uh, my father moved to Capron to uh, manage the farmer's elevator. They had uh, Um, a school in Capron, which covered the first eight grades and uh, two years of high school. As I recall, however, they only had three teachers. A man taught the uh, High, first two years of high school, all the subjects that were offered, and uh, the eighth grade. The two ladies uh, taught the uh, lower grades. In 1914, uh, I came to Alva and entered as a freshman in Northwestern State Normal. The normal schools were uh, set up on this sort of basis. They had the B class to which graduates from the eighth grade were admitted, the A class, then the freshman would correspond to juniors in high school. They had uh, four years of work, a combination of high school and college. Uh, the major portion of that work was education since the normal schools were set up to train teachers. Uh, Uh, without much regard as to what they were going to teach. Uh, they, uh, uh, not being born with a silver spoon in my mouth, I uh, dropped out and taught uh, a couple of years before I came back. And I finished the normal school, graduated from Northwestern State Normal in 1918, uh, just in time to go into service. Uh, I was very fortunate in uh, at that time they had set up a artillery officer's training camp at Camp Zachary Taylor just out of Louisville. We received demobilization orders about the 14th of November, 1918, and I was discharged and came back, arriving in Alva on the uh, 1st of December, 1918. 
there had been a flu epidemic, and uh, schools were just operating part-time because of sickness. And I got a job teaching at the high school at Winoka. I finished out that year. The following year, I was named uh, principal of the high school. The uh, next year, I was named superintendent of the schools, uh, which position I held for five years. Uh, in the meantime, I had uh, attended summer school at Oklahoma University and received the bachelor's degree in the summer of superintendent of schools down there, all of whom had bachelor's degree. So I was the first superintendent that didn't have a bachelor's degree until after I'd been there some time. Then uh, they, my major work on my bachelor's degree at the uh, Oklahoma University was physics and mathematics. Uh, I received a scholarship from Oklahoma University uh, i I believe it was about one of the first of the three scholarships that the university had offered. The uh, sc scholarship ha had uh, no particular duties attached, and we were, the three of us were listed in the catalog of the university as scholars. That probably was uh, <laughs> sort of an exaggerated <laughs> Mr. Cameron, what year was that you received the scholarship? 19, in 1925. I, I re, I'd finished the, uh, my fifth year as superintendent of Winoka, and <clears throat> the following year then I went to the university and did graduate work majoring in physics and mathematics. <coughs> in the, in the fall of 1926, uh, I came to Northwestern State Teachers College, so designated then, and uh, as uh, a teacher of physics and mathematics, uh, mostly mathematics, then for four years, I taught strictly college mathematics. And after that, uh, I taught a combination of physics and mathematics until after the Second World War, when uh, the demand for physics became sufficiently great to require my entire attention. The, uh, in the late 30s, Congress passed a bill uh, setting up a civilian pilot training program. This was uh, apparently an attempt on the part of uh, Congress to uh, prepare men for the Air Corps. Uh, for the impending war. Then when war was declared, 
um, there was a <coughs> a program set up uh, for a liaison pilot for the artillery. That was a, an idea of Colonel Ford uh, of having small airplanes, slow flying, uh, to go up and observe the uh, uh, artillery fire. The uh, <coughs> it was. Uh, wasn't accepted very enthusiastically by the Army, but it later proved to be very satisfactory. Uh, it looked like a person flying in a low-flying, slow-flying plane would be a sitting duck for the enemy. However, they didn't have any way near the casualties that you would anticipate. Well, we set the uh, program uh, was a combination between the uh, CAA and the Army. The college received a contract to uh, give the ground school training for uh, these liaison pilots. A local airport east of town had the contract to uh, train the flyers. Uh, my official capacity besides teaching various courses that which I didn't know anything about at the time, <laughs> but they uh, apparently assumed that anybody that had had physics could teach uh, aviation or anything to do with flying. <laughs> so I was designated the coordinator between the people that had the uh, contract for flying and the college. We trained about a uh, hundred liaison pilots. Uh, they had to be uh, they had to be past twenty five. They couldn't be over thirty five. They must have been turned down by the. Uh, uh, aviation part of the military before we could uh, uh, they could enroll here now they weren't exactly uh, they weren't soldiers however they were sworn in when they came <coughs> and we were at the, at the college had to supply uh, lodging and feed them, take care of their uh, any necessary medical problems that might arise, and uh, it was rather interesting. Because these men came from uh, all over the United States, uh, we had, uh, for instance, a policeman from Fort Worth, a very interesting person. He had a terrible time getting through uh, the uh, <coughs> ground school. But uh, he really worked, and uh, when he was given the examination, or they gave the examination, 
<coughs> the uh, Civil Aeronautics Authority conducted, came and conducted the examinations. We didn't uh, do that. And uh, this particular man, who was just under 35 years of age, <coughs> uh, completed the course with one of the top grades, if not the highest grade of the group. <coughs> the thing that was so surprised me after he had finished, he told me in a private conversation that he had never finished the eighth gra or fifth grade. Did these uh, pilot, pilot training courses, did they include actual solo flights? Oh, yes. And, and then after they graduated, did they all <coughs> become part of the armed forces? Yes, they had. On graduation, or well, after this 10 weeks program, this was a fast and furious affair, uh, they were uh, ordered to report for active duty. In other words, they considered this uh, detached service here for which they did not receive any army pay at the time, but later the army paid them for the time that they spent up here. They were assigned um, to uh, um, different places um, most of whom um, <coughs> graduated uh, after their completion of the work here. They wound up as navigators, um, control tower operators, and uh, a sizable group of them actually uh, went over to Europe and became um, uh, liaison pilots. They w these, uh, this training program was not accepted very enthusiastically by the Army um, Aviation. Uh, they uh, didn't think that they had received proper training as pilots but they had some 40 or 50 hours of actual flying in uh, the Piper Cubs and uh, some of uh, the boys that finished here went to a, an advanced uh, liaison pilot training program, one of which was held over at uh, Ponca City. Uh, they uh, uh, learned all sorts of ways to uh, handle the plane, even to landing crosswind uh, or landing any place that there was a flat surface. Uh, incidentally, one of the boys were, was killed um, in attempting to land on a, one of the uh, South Pacific Islands in a sort of a jungle. There just wasn't any place to, to, for them to land. Uh, <coughs> after about a year of training liaison pilots, the program was discontinued and the college was designated uh, as a place to uh, train pre-aviation cadets. We had, uh, that the program was entirely changed. The college uh, supplied living quarters for the men uh, who um, uh, came out of various branches of service. Uh, they were promised that they wouldn't re, uh, lose their rating. Some of 
who were ser uh, sergeants, if they came to take this program. This uh, pre-aviation uh, cadet training, they covered, they took some flying. I think it was 10 hours of actual flight time. Well, during the year or over that they had this program, we had about 2,000 aviation cadets here. They um, attempted to teach uh, physics, for instance, a year's physics in 10 weeks. And uh, <coughs> we had to have the laboratory facilities for these uh, students. We had about 80 uh, at a time. Well, they required, uh, got physics teachers every place we could break them up. They took uh, some meteorology. <coughs> they took some elementary math. I think it was designated as college math, but it was very elementary. And uh, we were in this program then until the uh, war was over. Well, the program was discontinued uh, shortly before the war was over. <coughs> now, you want me to come back? The, um, after the war, uh, then we had returning soldiers, and of course they were, uh, they came uh, as under the GI Bill, and many of whom uh, completed their, uh, well, they completed their college work, some of whom uh, started as freshmen. Um, then we had uh, quite a call for uh, physics graduates. Incidentally, the, uh, the um, Civil Aeronautics Board, and uh, in conjunction with the Weather Bureau, set up a program uh, offering a, a year's graduate work in meteorology for students who had completed a bachelor's degree in physics and <coughs> had a private pilot's license. There were 100 of these uh, scholarships granted in the United States. And we felt very proud of the fact that we received two of these original 100 scholarships. These, one of the boys uh, went in the Army as a meteorologist. The other one went in the Navy as a meteorologist. They continued this program in a more or less modified form for several years. And uh, we've had, we had uh, a few that uh, made an army a career. Presently, one of the boys is retired from the army, retired as a major, and is doing uh, uh, government work in meteorology in Switzerland. Then we had uh, several of the boys that uh, went into industry. There was quite a demand for uh, students with uh, backgrounds in physics and 
mathematics uh, by industries. Uh, could you tell us something about this uh, Cameron loan fund? I'll tell you about that. Uh, at the end of 35 years on the faculty, I retired in the sp in the summer of uh, 1961. At that time, uh, and prior to that time, we had uh, several boys who had majored in physics and mathematics working on the Continental Oil Company over at Ponca City. They came, <coughs> they had a sort of a surprise dinner and uh, together with uh, some of my colleagues on the faculty, they uh, had uh, set up a loan fund. The original amount was something in the order of $1,000. And uh, it was uh, my privilege to uh, set it up as I saw fit. But it was named in honor of me. So presently, that uh, loan fund is administered by the Northwestern State College Foundation. And it has grown very materially. The uh, uh, presently is something of the order of $25,000 in that loan fund. Uh, there. Are uh, do you know uh, where where did this money come from? This money was donations from these various individuals, students, and was uh, that that came from the con uh, the boys over at uh, Ponca City. It was matched by money from the Continental Oil Company. It bears your name. Yes, it. Is it still in existence today? Yes, the uh, loan fund is uh, carried in the catalog, designated as the John Cameron Loan Fund. And uh, the foundation has a total of right at $70,000, uh, which they make short time loans to. Uh, juniors and seniors, seventy thousand dollars, of course, wouldn't take care of very many students for any considerable period of time. But of course, we hope that the foundation will grow, and that eventually we'll be able to uh, take care of uh, students, say, throughout their a college career or something of that sort. <coughs> John, I wish you'd tell us something about these stories of John Dry is it Dreyer? About an uh, oh. he was an early day cowboy, wasn't he? Tom is Tom Dreyer. 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 Uh, my wife's folks. Uh, uh, came from Kansas to the Cherokee Strip. They uh, took a farm 10 miles north of Alpha, on which farm my wife was born. Uh, Mr. Dyer, her father, was a cowboy on the old O.E. Ranch, uh, headquarters up by Hartner. And uh, 
her mother uh, was helped with the uh, feeding of the cow hands and she and Mr. Dyer were married and uh, of course then he quit uh, ranching as such and uh, took up farming. He was very much interested in uh, early day history. <coughs> he wrote a booklet on old Kiowa. Uh, Kiowa, as we know it now, was the town designated by the Santa Fe Railroad. Uh, old Kiowa is uh, uh, located, I think it's north and west of uh, the present site of Kiowa. Um, right on the Kansas line? Maybe? Yeah, it's right on the Kansas line. <coughs> the um, um, Scott well, Scott Cummins uh, was my mother-in-law's father. Scott Cummins, of course, lived in uh, Medicine Lodge and around thereabouts, and apparently uh, took quite an interest in uh, politics at various times. And Jerry Simpson, a, a populist candidate for Congress, uh, designated as Sockless Jerry, uh, and I guess uh, what was the proper designation, ran for Congress. Well, Scott Cummins. Uh, made the public declaration that if Jerry Simpson was elected to Congress, he'd never cut his hair. Well, Jerry Simpson was elected, <laughs> and Scott Cummins never cut his hair. He wore long hair and a big cowboy hat. He was a, uh, had written, uh, well, he was uh, known as the Pilgrim Bard and had written a volume of poems. Uh, he uh, was a good storyteller and uh, didn't <coughs> necessarily confine himself to facts. <laughs> and he had a story, he told a story about being raised as, uh, among the Indians and uh, that they a squaw and his mother got the babies mixed up, and he was never right sure whether or not uh, he was not Indian. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of people <laughs> believe that he is part Indian, because probably because he wore long hair. See, uh, Scott Cummins came to uh, Kansas, I don't know just what year it was, but his wife, was the first white woman in Wellington, Kansas. And you say he did, uh, did you say he ran for Congress? Jerry Simpson. Simpson. Yes. What year was that? Oh, I couldn't tell you. I'm not going <laughs> to. Uh, what, what about that bone peddler? What, what does that term mean? Bone? Bone peddler. Well, uh, the, uh, those early day settlers were so hard up They'd go out and gather up buffalo bones and uh, sell them. And that was the uh, bone peddler part. The, uh, <laughs> that makes the story come somewhat disjointed. <laughs> you can reshape it. It's all right. Uh, Well, 
my school duties kept me so busy that I uh, didn't have time for much of anything else. Uh, however, I did uh, uh, serve on the board of the Methodist Church uh, for a good many years. Uh, had various uh, offices and so forth. And uh, after I retired, I served on the hospital board for about five years until my wife's failing health made it necessary that I get off. Uh, after my retirement, I also served on the draft board until uh, about a year ago when uh, I received a notice that my services were <coughs> no longer desired because I had reached the age of 75. <laughs> uh, the uh, draft board duties in, during this Vietnam War was a lot different from what they were back when you first went on there, weren't they? See, my draft board experience was entirely during the time of this Vietnam uh, conflict. Um, we, I tried to uh, act as a sort of a go-between the college and the uh, army, you might say. We tried to give uh, students the consideration in regard to deferments uh, for college purposes. Um, however, at that particular time, it was very easily observed that one of the reasons why we had such an enormous uh, increase in enrollment in colleges was because the fellows didn't want to go to the army. <laughs> Their uh, Patriotism was about on the par of the uh, uh, pioneers that came down here uh, when the strip opened. Uh, they had to be rugged and hardy individuals or they never would have survived. But uh, the reason they stayed was because they didn't have any place to go or didn't have anything to <laughs> go on. So that made a lot of them. A lot of them were given credit for being uh, rugged pioneers when they were forced to be rugged pioneers. <laughs> that's, that's what you call a like it is. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Without any embellishments. Of course, everybody was poor. Some were poor than others, and that's about the... Uh, when did you, you mentioned your wife was sick, when did your wife die? She died in 60, uh, Mabel died in 67. She's been gone a little over five years. And you have a daughter too. Yes, you? I have a daughter. I have grandchildren, but you don't want to hear about them. I'd use up all your tape. That was my father's, my, my grandfather, paternal grandfather, that filed on a claim in old Oklahoma, was uh, uh, appraised of the fact that he wasn't a citizen of the United States. He'd just come down from Canada. He served four years in the uh, Union Army so he became a citizen after he filed on this claim in uh, old Oklahoma in 1889. <laughs> his, uh, he never knew much about his uh, 
uh, parentage. Uh, he knew uh, his uh, father and or mother, one or the other, uh, came from Ireland and the other one from Scotland. And then they <coughs> settled in Canada. Uh, he had several brothers with whom he never kept in contact. Uh, he, uh, so I, the name Cameron is very common in this part of the country, but so far as I know, there's not uh, any relation of mine. However, the uh, things of all came from Canada, and uh, one branch went the west one of them went down through Missouri and, and Oklahoma and Texas. <coughs> and there was another family of Camerons here in Alva that, that uh, were no relatives of mine that I know of. Uh, you had many, many years experience in the college there. What was the most exciting experience you ever had during those days there? I don't know that I ever had any very exciting experiences. <coughs> uh, uh, meeting classes regularly and so forth. Sometimes get to be rather humdrum. <coughs> <coughs> the most pleasing experiences that I've had have been the experiences of my former students who've gone out and done well in industry. Uh, or in a profession. Uh, <coughs> we had a, we had a large number of young men and women, few, <coughs> that uh, finished their pre-medic work here at the college. But uh, most of them, uh, well, Physics is required for pre-medic students. I don't know that I could explain why, other than they thought that was a good hurdle course, I think, to get rid of some of it. Well, the relationship between the teacher and student is a lot different today from what it was when you started teaching. Well, I, of course, been out of touch with students for uh, 12 years, but uh, I uh, think that the uh, students of years gone by are pretty much the same as uh, the students we have now. There were some of them that were very serious minded and some of them were less. Um, in mentioning uh, the high school at Capron, uh, one teacher teaching um, four years, or two years of high school, plus the eighth grade. In 1915, my brother Charles uh, was one of the three graduating seniors. Uh, another was uh, George Lightburn, and the third was uh, Marjorie Nelson, a cousin. The interesting thing about the, this particular class, two of these members, two boys, made who's who in America. Um, my brother was um, on the engineering faculty, at electrical engineering faculty at OSU, and 
George Byburn was uh, a member of the uh, Federal Farm Board, Farm Credit Board. Uh, they served on those were the uh, reasons particularly for their uh, importance. But the two-thirds of the high school class of the uh, country high school making who's who is a little bit unusual. Do uh, you remember any of those, that what the names were? The two? Charles Cameron and George Lightburn. Uh, George has passed away. Charles is retired, has been retired some what? five or six years from OSU faculty. Presently lives in Stillwater, however. This is uh, CJ2, your interviewer, and I'm closing this interview with uh, John Cameron at Alva, Oklahoma on October the 24th, 1924. This is CJ2 from Oklahoma City, and I'm here at Alva on uh, October the 24th, 1972. I've come here to interview Dorothy Snoddy, S-N-O-D-D-Y, of Alva, Oklahoma. She's going to give us some of the highlights of her life and there are some interesting episodes to tell us about. Miss Snoddy. Okay. Well, I was, I was born uh, down by, by Holton, and uh, my mother was, uh, maiden name was Carrie Gamble, and uh, uh, my dad was uh, John Henry Walker, and my parents separated, and then my mother married Cook Snoddy. Okay, married Cook Snoddy, and then we uh, lived on a farm southeast of Alva, and then we moved to a farm west of Alva, oh, in the White Horse community. And White Horse Township, and he would tell a lot of interesting stories about the early days. And he said the reason they made the run in Oklahoma was they had a three-year drought up in Kansas. They didn't, they didn't have a thing or nothing to eat. They, they uh, seeds and things and wheat and corn that they put in the ground up there was still on the ground three years and had never sprouted. And the reason they uh, had to come down here, they couldn't pay their taxes, they were losing their homes and their ranches and their farms and their city lots. And then when the opening was ready to open up, why, it was just a new opportunity for them. And there was a lot of grass down here for their cattle and livestock. There was just worlds of, uh, of game. There was uh, turkey and deer and uh, a few little black bears and rabbits and quail and prairie chicken, just everything. And uh, then when they came down and filed on their claims, why, it was just a, a new beginning for them. And the, the reason the government hurried up to open the strip was because of the drought in Kansas. People were just desperate for something, someplace to go. And then uh, Cook and I did a file on the claim on Boggy Creek up north of Alva. And he was in his 21st year, but he wasn't 21 yet. And, uh, he put his uh, stake down and uh, tied his pony up. And the gray wolf scared it in the night, and it broke loose and went clear on up to Kiowa, where he left. He left in Kiowa that morning. So uh, the next morning, why a girl showed up, and her name was Smith, 
And he, uh, he knew him up in Bobby County, and she said, well, Cook, you're not 21 yet. And so he said, I'm going to file on this claim. And he didn't have his pony, and he said, oh, all right. He just picked up his saddle and his shovel and went over the hill, and Tom uh, Dyer was there, and they had a camp there, and he wanted to borrow a horse. And he said, well, there's a dozen horses that doesn't belong to anybody here. Just rope one of them, and when you get down to Iowa, well, just turn it loose, and the owner will probably find it. And so he did that, and then he, he took a lot, the town lot in Alpha. And he found his father's, uh, what he thought was his father's camp there in, in, in the square. And uh, so he gave him a good meal and everything, and when he just got about done, why it wasn't his father's tent at all. It belonged to the surveyors that were surveying in here. And, the, and he said that the, by nightfall, there was 10,000 people in Alpha there. And the, the, the first uh, hotel in Alpha was a circus camp. And they get the... Uh, uh, Gene Hartley brought it down from Kiowa, and then the, the first restaurant was a tent pitched by the land office, and it was uh, uh, Sam Llewellyn owned it, and he had that was his tent there, and then the, the first sod house that was built was uh, uh, McGinley was his name, and. He lived in it for seven years before he built this house. Those sod houses, were they made out of mud? No. Oh, no. Not mud. They they took the sod plows and plowed up the, the street, and then they cut them in about foot, about a foot to slabs, like you would the brick. And then they just laid them up like you would do brick. And then they have their windows and the same doors and everything. And then on the inside, they were about a, well, the width of the sod plow, they were about the six or eight inches thick, and they were warm. And they, and they plastered, kind of plastered them over with the clay mud like, and then they would paper them with newspaper. That way. That's the, that's the way they made the sod houses. What kind of roof did they have on Well, they would generally <coughs> put the, if they had the lumber, they'd put lumber up, and then they would put sod over the top of it. And it would green up like that and, and when they got rain. And let uh, me see now. Oh, yes, and E. W. Snyder, he was the deputy United States Marshal, and he brought the train into Alva from Kiowa with the settlers in it that didn't have any any horses or wagons or anything. Did, did he marshal out, yes. out of what, what city? Well, uh, he next appointed him, and he was uh, for Oklahoma, mm -hmm. for, for the uh, territory down mm -hmm. here. He got his commission in 1891, his first commission, and he had three other commissions after that. That was your uncle? Yeah, Cook not his brother. His uh -huh. name was E.W. Snyder, Erskine W. Uh-huh, and he brought the train in, just full of settlers. That was the first train to come into the Cherokee City? To Alva. Oh, to Alva. From Kiowa. And At high noon, he left high noon. And they were all settlers, right? Yeah, people, and, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, uh, Sam Johnson, the first postmaster, was on. On the train. Postmaster uh -huh. in Alva. Yeah, Alva Postmaster. And then the, uh, his son, uh, General Hugh Johnson, he was on it. Hugh Johnson? Yeah, he was the MRA head under Franklin Roosevelt. And he got his education. What was his name? General Hugh Johnson. Oh, well, I remember him. Uh huh. He got his education at the Northwestern State College. Yeah. Yeah, he had some federal agent. In our age. In our age. Uh, during the draft and depression. Yeah. That was the, that, that, his son. The first postmaster's son. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, he was on the train. He said he was about 12 years old, and he was just running around up and down over the tops of the cars, over the tops of the cars, on the way down here. The kid was. Uh, oh, what? Um, well, now what? Uh, 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 another, another uncle was then adopted. No, my, my uncle mm -hmm. was uh, Dr. D. Gamble. Mm -hmm. He didn't come in at the opening, but he came in a few years later. He was a real horse and buggy doctor. He, was a, he graduated from the Rush Medical College in Chicago. And uh, uh, then uh, uh, my mother's father was uh, Judge Gamble, but he didn't come in at the run. He came in about 1900. But, uh, oh, uh, my uncle, her brother, was uh, with the newspaper with uh, Frank Hatfield, the pioneer. And, and Frank Hatfield uh, published his paper at Attica and brought it down on the train, the Pioneer, and put the, uh, 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 he threw a paper out at every tent door the night of the opening. That was the paper. The, the first paper, where was that now? In Alba. Where? In Alba. Alba. Uh, the first paper in Alba, the Pioneer, the Alba Pioneer. And he brought, he brought the press on the train? No, he brought the paper. He had him printed in Attica and brought him down on the train, and then he brought his press down when he had to ha got the place to put it. See, you, you have to have a building for it. You can't put it in a tent, you know, or anything like that. And uh, then, the, uh, then he was in the newspaper business for years and years and years. He lived uh, old. I think he was 96 when he died. What was his name? Frank Hatfield. Uh -huh. He was a... Well known newspaper man. Was he relationship to you? No, uh, my uncle worked for him, Bob Gamble. He was on the paper with him. And let me see now, this, and then, let me see now, George Cole, the Cole brothers, now he started a lumber yard in Alpha, and he brought his lumber down from Harper and Kiowa <laughs> to sell to people. And then, uh, oh, J.E. Peoples and William uh, Thomas helped uh, build a college in our Northwestern State Normal School. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sherman Peoples called me three or four days ago, uh, evening, and he's sending the tools that Mr. Thomas had for me to donate to the uh, college museum up here. And uh, 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 then his, uh, his father was a carpenter in Alvin, and he made the, he made the uh, nickel home up here. <laughs>